Well, welcome back as we continue to march forward with our polar graphs and, and uh, get ready to, hopefully we're about two days away from really jumping into the intense calculus um, parts of our polar graphs, but we're just tidying up our pre-calc stuff, getting used to plotting points and, and uh, plotting graphs. And just to review what we've covered so far, the first thing we talked about was circles that were centered at the origin. And these came in very simple forms, such as R equals four. And that was a circle that had a diameter of eight, or, or simply as indicated, a radius of four. Um, we also looked at Archimedes' spiral, R equals theta, and that was a real fun one. Um, got kind of bigger as it continued to loop out and around. And, uh, and then we started to look at circles that were symmetric with a particular axis. R equals A times the sine of theta was symmetric with respect to what we used to call the y-axis, or R equals A times the cosine of theta was symmetric to the old x-axis, and A represented our diameter that told us how big we were. Probably the most significant thing that came out of that section was the fact that it only took from zero to pi radians to complete one cycle. Um, if we continue to go beyond pi, we would begin to retrace over the top of the existing circle. And then we finished with a real exciting limicon with that inner loop, and we said the generic form was r equals a plus b times the sine of theta, or you could replace sine with cosine. But the bottom line there was the absolute value of a was smaller than the absolute value of b. Okay, that was probably the most important thing. So anytime we have that kind of inequality, we know we've got the inner loop coming. And it's really important to always make note of when the inner loop started and when it ends. Today, we're going to march forward and we're going to ask ourselves, first of all, with regards to that uh, similar setup, if we talked about r equaling a plus b times the sine or cosine of theta, what happens if the absolute value of a is equal to the absolute value of b, or what happens if the absolute value of a is greater than the absolute value of b? And then what we're going to finish with is we're going to finish with some rose petals. We're going to talk about sine of, um, let's see, I'll, I'll use a again a times theta or cosine of a times theta and we're gonna see some rose petals develop so that's where we're heading today so buckle up hang tight and here we go for our first example today we're gonna try to graph r equals 2 plus 2 cosine of theta so to set that up we're gonna first try to investigate y equals 2 plus 2 cosine of x and again, jump in our math time machine and go back to Algebra 2 and talk about how we would have graphed that by hand. The first thing you notice is there's a vertical shift at 2. So I'm going to draw a faint dotted line at 2. And essentially from this point forward, I'm going to pretend that that's my x-axis. I'm going to remind, I'm going to put a slash mark for pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. And then what I'm going to do, I notice that the amplitude is 2. So that means I need to go 2 units above and 2 units below that axis. I'm going to start up here at 4 cross, dip down, touch the x-axis, and then shoot back up. So this is what 2 plus 2 cosine of x looks like. You notice that um, this one only has one x-intercept, and which means that the polar graph is only going to touch the pole or the origin one time, once. All right. All right. So let's start graphing. Uh, the first point that I notice is... 0 comma 4 so I need to go I'm gonna today I'm gonna do my scaling by ones so not to hopefully not to trip you up but we're gonna go 1 2 3 4 right there that's my first dot my next one's pi over 2 comma 2 so I'm gonna go up to 2 um, then I've got pi 0 so that's gonna put me right at the pole 3 pi over 2 comma 2 so that's going to drop me down here and then the last one 2 pi comma 4 that's just going to be a duplicate of the first one now <laughs> um, my drawing is going to be a little scary I'm going to after I get done attempting to draw this I'm going to import what a real one should look like so that we're all on the same page but it is going to be very sharp right there I'll tell you what Certainly not perfect, but I'm, I'll am tell you what, that's a lot better than most of mine look, so I hope you're not laughing too hard at that one. Um, this is what we call a cardioid, okay? So we have a very special name whenever the absolute value of A is equal to the absolute value of B. This is called a cardioid. 
And here's what here's the one I imported uh, that I uh, the image I found in Google. So this is what a real cardioid should look like. This one's a little bit smaller. This one is tech. You notice it only goes out to two. So that's actually r equals one plus one cosine of theta. But it's very similar to ours, and you kind of get the idea of you know how sharp that is right there when it touches the pole. And then I found this other image. I just couldn't resist showing. It's a little psychedelic, I guess, but there, it's a fractal. Uh, with cardioids. So you'll see kind of uh, the cardioid type behavior um, on one iteration there and then it's you know just uh, a very iterative pattern with smaller cardioids uh, building off of that one. So just kind of a weird thing that I had to show you. Our second example tonight is we're going to ask ourselves what happens if the A value is bigger than the B value. All right, so we're going to consider y equals 3 plus 2 sine of x, first of all. So we've got that uh, crazy vertical shift all the way up here at 3. And then on top of that, we've got an amplitude of 2. So we're going to, the sine curve, of course, always starts at the origin, so to speak. And then it goes 2 units above and then 2 units below. And one of the interesting characteristics here is that this graph has no x-intercepts. All right, which means this polar graph is going to never touch the pole. All right, never touch the pole. Um, just, just an interesting thing to think about. It just, and we tried to emphasize last night that every time we, um, our rectangular graph has an x-intercept, then the corresponding polar equation will cross through the origin or the pole. And um, just something to keep note of. All right, let's see if we can piece this better together. The first one I want to plot is 0, 3. Again, scaling by 1s. I'll put me right there. Pi over 2, 5. I got just enough room to squeeze that in way up top. Pi, 3. I'm going to slide to the left here. Uh, 3 over pi over 2 comma 1. It's going to put me right there. And then we'll finish with 2 pi comma 3. And that's going to duplicate the very first point I had. Uh, trying to connect these points is somewhat of a challenge. What's interesting, though, is we're not going to have a sharp point. Um, what's going to happen, we're going to swoop up and around. We're going to dip below and then kind of smooth it out there for a second. Yeah, this is called um, a limicon with a dimple. Okay, it's a limicon with a dimple, and it's actually very smooth in this area right here. It's not sharp like the cardioid was and pointed. Very smooth, just a subtle wave and wrinkle to it as we go through there. All right, now I think we're ready for some rose petals. Well, we're ready to tackle our first rose petal here, and this will certainly be our, our biggest challenge of the day. And a couple of things we want to keep track of is how many radians it takes to complete one rose petal. That's going to be an ongoing theme throughout the next couple of weeks. So we're going to investigate y equals the cosine of 3x. And you notice we, have a, we don't have a vertical shift. Our amplitude is just an ordinary 1. But what's interesting here is we have a frequency of 3. And if you remember anything about frequency, that tells you how many cycles you're going to complete between 0 and 2 pi. So what we know instantly is we need to complete three cosine cycles between 0 and 2 pi. Now the next question becomes, what's the graph's period? Um, in other words, how long does it come take to complete one cycle? And maybe you recall from trig is that the period is always 2 pi divided by the frequency. So in this case, 2 pi over 3 also known as 120 degrees, is going to take, that's how long it takes to complete the first cycle. So a couple of important features here. Um, I chose a little different graph paper here for this one. I wanted one that counted in increments of 30. So we've got 30, 60, 90. Right here is where the 2 pi over 3 is. And I'm going to go to a finer pen tip so I can maybe squeeze this in here. Right there, that's your 2 pi over 3. So you're going to see one complete cosine curve within that interval. Uh, let's see here. So it's going to, cosine's going to, let's see. I'm going to scale the height so that that first block, let's say that's a height of 1. Every two blocks is 1 on the y-axis. So let's say cosine starts there, has an x-intercept at 30 degrees, pi over 6, dips down to negative 1, crosses at 90, and then peaks at 2 pi over 3. So there's one cosine cycle. And uh, I'm going to, before I go any further on that one, I want to transfer what I have now over to polar. 
And here's where it gets fairly interesting. My first ordered pair right here is 0, 1. So if I put that on polar again, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scale the polar graph so that every two circles is one unit. So I'm going to put that dot right there. That's my very first point. Now my next significant point is pi over 6 comma 0. Anytime your theta has a, or I'm sorry, screw that up. So this is going to be my theta, this is going to be my r. Anytime your r is 0, that means you are at the pole. Okay, so I'm going to put a dot right there. And if I connected those two points, now notice within this region, the y values are positive, so that means the corresponding r values are positive, and we are above the old x-axis. So there's an important note that I want you to make right away. Let's see here, we'll slide that in. That um, if I started at 0 radians and I ended at pi over 6 radians, all right, I've already completed half of a rose petal, okay, half of a petal just from 0 to pi over 6. Now we'll continue to go forward here. I'm going to switch colors a little bit. The next significant point is pi over 3, comma, negative 1. So I'm finding that radial line. Now when I say radial line, I'm referring to this line right here. Okay, that's a radial line, and it extends all the way across the paper. Now, if I'm on this radial line right here, I need to go negative 1. So that's going to put me right there. Let's see. Did I, I don't think that's right. Hold on. Let me regroup. I, sh I should have been on pi over 3. I'm sorry. That's going to shoot me right there. Okay, that feels a lot better. Let's see if I can erase that. That's better. That's better. Now we're cooking. All right. Then the next significant point is at pi over 2. So at pi over 2, we've got uh, 0, which means I'm back at the pole. So we're going to swoop in. And it's important. Um, mine, let's see, I don't want you to cross through the y-axis. I want you to stay just to the left of the y-axis. And so let's make a note that from pi over 6 until pi over 2, we completed one entire petal. All right, that's one entire petal. So the reason I'm emphasizing this is because later on, they're going to ask you to find the area of one petal. So you could, in order to find the area of one petal, we could integrate from pi over 6 to pi over 2, and that would tell us the area of one petal. That's, that's the main reason we're emphasizing that so much. All right, we march forward here. We're marching forward, we're marching forward. Let's see, 2 pi over 3 comma 1. That's kind of a nice one. That's just going to be up here, I believe. 2 pi over 3 is right there. Or do I need to go over one more? i got to go over one more. My bad. Let's see. Oops. Don't do that. All right. So we're really right there. Now, before I go any further on my polar graph, I've got to go back and i got to do a little bit more with my rectangular graph. Let's see. We've got a root right there. Dip down. we got a root. And then we peak. So we finished another cycle. That's my second one. And you'll notice there is room to get another one in there if we had to. All right, how does that help us? Well, let's see, what is this bear right here? If I'm, You can count in degrees. We're going um, 30s right here, 60, 90, 120, and then 150. Now 150 is, let's see, isn't that 5 pi over 6 comma 0? So that's a pole right there. All right, we got to hit the pole. And that's going to complete that second pedal. Again, that pedal should be entirely to the left of the y-axis, so mine are just a little sloppy. I want to keep it sharply on the left side. And then we're going to finish up here. We've got, um, that's pi comma negative 1. That's going to put me right back where I started, so that's going to finish that lower half right there. And I tell you what, so from 0 to pi, we completed the entire polar graph, and that gave me a grand total of three petals. It's important to know, if you tried to graph beyond pi, you would just continue to retrace over the already existing graph. Um, another shortcut here, again, we're, we're trying to get ahead of ourselves a little bit to make next week a little easier. If they asked for the area 
of one petal only. Here's what we do. We already said that you could graph, or integrate, I should say, from pi over 6 to pi over 2. But I got an even better idea. You remember when we did half a petal? Let's integrate from 0 to pi over 6. That's going to give you the area of half a petal, and then just double that answer. And I think that's the most efficient way to find the area of one petal. One last note. Okay, Remember this equation? We said it was r equals the cosine of 3 theta. If that number right there, if your frequency is an odd number, then you will have that number of petals. So we had a grand total of three petals. Um, let's see. If I said r equals the sine of 5 theta, again, 5's odd. So you would have, because that's odd, you would have a grand total of five petals when you were all done. We're going to find out here in a few seconds that if that's an even number, things change. All right, here it comes, our last one for the night, example number four, and I'm going to try to do r equals the sine of 2 theta. And so you'll notice that our frequency is an even number. We said that that's going to change. In fact, I think we're going to find out that there's um, twice that many petals. We're going to end up with a grand total of four petals by the time we're all done. So here's the deal. Our frequency is a 2. That means uh, when I graph this curve from 0 to 2 pi rectangularly, we're going to see a grand total of 2 cycles. Um, the period is going to be 2 pi divided by 2, which is just pi. So from 0 to pi, we'll see 1 cycle. And that means the sine curve is going to start here. It's going to peak at pi over 4, root at pi over 2, bottom out there, and finish there. So there's one complete cycle. Now I'm going to take my time and try to transfer that over onto the polar graph. First point, 0, 0. That's going to put me right at the pole. And then the next point is pi over 4, comma 1. Now what I'll do again is I'm going to scale this so every two cycles is one unit just to kind of space it out and give it some depth. I don't want the graph to be too much on top of itself. And then pi over 2 is back at the pole. So what happened is from 0, we start here, we swoop up, and we come right back to the pole. So let's make a note that from 0 to pi over 2, we finish our first entire complete petal. And again, you know why that's important to know, because we're going to do the area of one petal later on. All right, switching color. So we'll go green here. Uh, let's see. So we left off. Let's go 3 pi over 4, negative 1. Now picture the radial line, 3 pi over 4, but we need to shoot in the negative direction, and that's going to put me right there. And then at pi, we're already back to the pole, so it's real quick. We're swooping out and back. So from pi over 2 to pi is our second pedal. I'm going to go back. Let's finish that rectangular graph. We know it's going to be a nice easy one. We get that second cycle in there. We'll go back. Let's pick another color. 5 pi over 4 comma 1 is going to put me right here. And 3 pi over 2 is back at the pole. So it's going to swoop this way. Um, and then one more petal. Let's see. 7 pi over 4, but it's negative 1, so it shoots us back here. And then 2 pi is back at the pole. So kind of a colorful petal here. What did we learn about this one? Well, it actually took us, we had to go all the way to 2 pi to complete this rose. And that gave us a grand total of four petals. Now that was different. The last one, when it was odd, we only had to go to pi to complete it. And everything from pi to 2 pi was retracing. So it's important to know that on these even numbers, we actually have to go all the way to 2 pi to finish it off. And we'll kind of generalize what we just said here. If um, Oops, I don't want y. If we do r equals the sine of, we'll say a theta. If a is an even number, we are going to have a grand total of 2 times a petals. All right. So let's say, for instance, in a, you know, of course, sine could be replaced with cosine. So let's go with cosine of 4 theta. We're going to have 8 petals by the time we're all done, and that's going to be, that would be a very tough one to graph. It would be very time intensive and so forth. So uh, if you're going to take anything away from these, let's make sure we know how many radians it takes to complete one petal, and let's know how many radians it takes to complete the entire graph. So there was, we saw a cardioid, we saw a limicon with a dimple, and we saw some odd and even um, rose petals. So uh, good luck. We'll see you tomorrow.